Now we'll talk about the second dimension researchers use to evaluate measures, which is validity. Validity is the extent to which scores from a measure actually represent the variable they are intended to. Validity is, for our purposes, independent from reliability. You can have an extremely reliable measure that has really poor validity. If a researcher wanted to measure attention span using someone's height, they would be heavily criticized. Measuring someone's height is no doubt a really reliable measurement. That doesn't change much in adulthood. But height in no way measures or is related to someone's attention span. So that would have really low validity. Take these four bullseye targets as a way to think about this. Going from left to right, a measure could be really reliable, but just completely miss the target. This is the height and attention span example. Something could have low reliability and low validity, this being the worst measurement of all. You could have low reliability but high validity. Um, with this, you're tapping into the right construct, but scores just vary too much and aren't reliable. Finally, the best kind of measure has high reliability and high validity. This is what we strive for, and we can see that scores are similar and are right on target. So the specific types of validity we'll talk about in this video are face validity, content validity, and criterion validity. The first type of validity is face validity. This is the extent to which a measurement method appears on its face to measure the construct of interest. Finger length has nothing to do with measuring someone's self-esteem, and that's why we wouldn't ever use that as a measure. It's just not valid. An example that has good face validity, for instance, is the Beck Depression Inventory. This, among other things, asks like how sad you are and other measures that people have agreed upon that really is related to and is measuring depression. There are ways to measure face validity, um, and people do use them. To do this, you would just recruit a separate sample of people and ask them to rate a bunch of items on how much your questions appear to address the issue you want to measure. However, the majority of the time, face validity is assessed informally. Another more concrete example I'll talk about real quick um, is again related to intelligence. Sorry, I know I use, uh, use this example quite a bit, but it does get the point across. When intelligence tests were being developed and validated, a lot of court cases ensued about the notion that they were discriminatory or discriminated against African American children and that the tests were biased. Indeed, when IQ tests were being normalized, they were only given to white European children. Some of the questions could mean something entirely different to different groups at the societal level. One question included, who wrote Romeo and Juliet? I mean, is that really measuring intelligence, or does that measure whether a family was more inclined to talk about literature at home? On a comprehension test, a child might have to identify what a tennis court looks like by looking at a picture of it. Honestly, some children from poor neighborhoods might have just never seen a tennis court before. That doesn't mean that they're any more stupid for it. Um, there are just plain cultural differences there. IQ tests were also biased against um, people from some Christian countries. On a picture completion task, they might think that a cross was missing from the roof of a house instead of a chimney. Where they grew up, they probably didn't have chimneys on roofs, but churches would have crosses on them. The point here is that IQ tests may not have really been assessing intelligence in some groups of people. Okay, content validity is the extent to which a measure covers the construct of interest. Content validity is also usually not assessed quantitatively. Instead, it's assessed carefully by checking the measurement against the conceptual definition of a construct. For instance, a scale measuring depression might lack content validity if it only addresses one part of the construct, but not all of them, especially if it's multifaceted. So if the scale only measured the affective dimension, but not the behavioral dimension, content validity would be low. If it measured both the affective and behavioral dimension, then content validity wouldn't be a problem in that case. Criterion validity is the extent to which people's scores on a measure are correlated with other variables or criteria that you might expect them to correlate with. Say you create a new measure of test anxiety. We know that test anxiety is related to poor performance on tests. So your measure should be negatively correlated with actual test performance. That is, higher scores on your test anxiety measure should be related to lower scores on a given test. Criterion here um, is used kind of loosely and could include anything that you might think would be related to your new measure or construct. 
we can also identify two different subtypes of criterion validity. If the criterion you're using is measured at the same time as the construct you're measuring, this is referred to as concurrent validity. If the criterion you're using is um, taken sometime in the future or after the construct you measured, this is referred to as predictive validity. If you go out and measure depression using a new depression scale, you might figure that it would be related to the number of times people report leaving their house. Assuming that they're both measured at the same time, this would be concurrent validity. Scores on your measure that might predict future occurrences of social interactions would be predictive validity, assuming that those two things are not measured at the same time. Okay, the last little bit on validity I'll talk about is discriminant validity. This is the extent to which scores on a measure are not correlated with other measures um, that are conceptually distinct. We know that self-esteem and mood are different. Self-esteem measures an attitude towards oneself, and it's pretty stable over time, um, whereas mood can vary from day to day. So for your measures to have good discriminant validity, your self-esteem score should not correlate well with mood. If it does, the critique there could be that your measure doesn't really measure self-esteem, but it actually measures mood. Similar to discriminant validity is convergent validity, um, but it's kind of the opposite, where it's the extent to which your measure does correlate with other similar measures of the same construct. For a given construct, there's not going to be just one measure. Multiple researchers will probably have different variations or measures that they have developed. If they're all measuring the same thing, they should all correlate well together. Okay, wrapping up everything we've talked about in the past few videos on psychological measurement, reliability, and validity, we can outline some practical steps. First, we need to conceptually define the construct we want to measure. Have a clear definition of it. This allows you to make good decisions on how to measure it. Make it specific. Don't just study memory, study long-term episodic memory. Decide on how you're going to operationally define your measure. It's always good to use an existing measure. Um, a lot of times other researchers will have done the hard work for you, but it's totally okay to create your own measure. Be able to quantify what you want to measure. Then implement your measure and do it in a way that maximizes reliability and validity. Test all of your participants under similar conditions. Make sure they're all paying attention and they're not too distracted. And also be careful of aspects that can influence the way participants can respond. And then once you've used your measure, be sure to evaluate it thoroughly in terms of reliability and validity. And if you need to change some aspects of your measure, that's totally fine. Measures are developed over time, and it's rare that people get it right the first try. And then a final note, be sure to consider sensitivity and range effects. You want your measure to be sensitive enough to pick up the measurements that you want to study. If an experimental drug has small but consistent effects on response times on the scale of, say, 50 milliseconds, you need to make sure you use a device that records response times on the scale of milliseconds, not seconds, or else you'll miss the entire effect of the drug. Take classroom exams as an, another example. I know students hate exams with a ton of questions, but consider this. If you took a test with only five questions and you miss one, you get a B on the test. There might not be enough questions for you to truly show your knowledge of a concept, and that one question might be the only question you don't know. If there are 50 questions and you miss three, you would still get an A on the test. Similar to this idea, in research you want to try and avoid ceiling and floor effects. This is where per, uh, performance in a test already starts really high or really low. So if you want to measure change in performance um, over time, say on a learning task, but people already start at 95%, there's really no room to get better on the task, so it won't tell you much about learning over time. Same thing could happen with floor effects. Say you want to see how a drug impairs performance on a task over time, but if people are already getting 10% of the problems right, it can't really get much worse anyway. Okay, a couple of things to take home and keep in mind. Uh, make sure you're able to define and distinguish the different types of validity and reliability and also the levels of measurement that we've covered over the past few videos. Study and be prepared to read scenarios and be able to tell me at what level of the measurement it's at, um, whether it would have high or low reliability or validity. Okay, so that's it for this video and we'll see you all next time.